Action. Left. Action. Okay. Great. So, uh, my name is Andrew Davis. This is my first time reporting for Riot News. Uh, we are here in Marrakesh, Morocco, and we're going to take you inside the uh, Clinton Global Initiative event that's happening here. So, you've probably heard of the Clinton Global Initiative and its parent organization, the Clinton Foundation, in recent weeks, as both have emerged at the center of a controversy over questions of undue influence, foreign money, and backroom deals in American politics. Unsatisfied with the coverage over this controversy, I simply wanted to go see for myself what the Clinton Foundation does and if there is really anything for all of us to be worried about. So after that uh, fun cab ride, I was able to change, I got my press credentials, and now we're about to go inside to the Clinton Global Initiative event and see President Clinton speak. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to chat just a bit about what the Clinton Global Initiative, or CGI, does. They're a huge organization with a really wide reach. They're involved in everything from saving elephants in Africa to building new homes for Hurricane Katrina victims. But the interesting thing is that they don't actually implement or give money to these projects themselves. Instead, CGI acts as a sort of catalyst for change by holding events where they convene a wide variety of leaders to find new solutions to pressing global challenges. Then, to implement these solutions, CGI partners with the organizations that these leaders set up. Companies like Coca-Cola, foundations like the World Wildlife Fund, and even intrepid grassroots NGOs run by young people like, uh, you know, you and me. Um, and so we're going to go inside right now and kind of talk to some of these young people and hopefully some of these civil society leaders, etc., about, you know, the exciting things that they're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you very much. In the Middle East and North Africa, we have some of the youngest, most dynamic populations in the world. We have to decide how to provide the education and job training, the employment and entrepreneurial opportunities to empower them to create broad-based economic growth and inclusive societies in which our differences make life richer and more interesting, but do not tear us apart. So upstairs, there's a kind of main room where everyone meets at the beginning of the day, and then they come down here, and there's basically three to four rooms where smaller events will be held. It's about 100 people, maybe 150 at most. Uh, they start off with like a panel or a discussion or a major speaker, and then a lot of times what will happen is they'll break off and they'll do smaller discussions within those rooms. As I headed into those smaller discussions, I had a chance to sit down with one of the many creative problem solvers that CGI is known for bringing together. Her name was Savanya Ari, and she's combining green energy with cutting edge Israeli technology to alleviate poverty faster, more sustainably, and more efficiently. This is Savan, and her organization, aptly named Innovation Africa, has already improved the lives of over 700,000 people since she first launched it as a student in 2008. Oh, well, thank you, Andrew. And you're right, we are a young organization with a young spirit that quickly understood that solar energy can make so much difference in Africa. Many people are spending two to three hours a day looking for water. And if they find water, usually it's by digging by hands. The water is not good. Two out of five kids are dying before the age of five for waterborne diseases. And yet you and I know that there is plenty of water in Africa, really. All of the water is deep in the aquifers. What we need? A few solar panels so that you can pump the water up. And that's what we do. We come, we bring a drilling machine, we drill to the aquifers. We can find water in 20 meters, 30 meters. We use the solar panels to make the pump, pump the water to a tank and from tank to gravity, it goes to the different places in the village. Cheap, easy, simple to do. And here is the good news. From Israel, I'm able to bring a system that allows us to monitor how everything is working in the villages. Oh, wow. So we are able to know how much water is pumped, how much energy is produced, and if something breaks, we get alerts. Next, I was on my way to meet with Zainab Salbi. In addition to creative young problem solvers like Savan, CGI also gathers veteran civil society leaders like Zainab to help guide the larger discussion over each event's most pressing global challenges. 
a native Iraqi who grew up trapped inside Saddam Hussein's inner circle, a story humanitarian who has worked in some of the world's most war-torn countries, and the new host of a highly anticipated Arab television show, Zainab is the person at CGI to talk to about the fast-emerging millennial Middle East. 60% of the population in the region, in the Middle East and North Africa, are under the age of 30. Um, they are highly educated, but they have the highest unemployment rate in the world. Um, they're also the realities were very, very different than the reality I grew up in, in Iraq, for example. Young women in Iraq, in my own same country, same city, they don't drive anymore. They asked me, is it true that you did not wear headscarf or people did not wear headscarf when you were in your generation? And they, what my life at only my mid 40s, it seems like history for them. So there's, it's, a, it's a point, it's a time of shifting sands in the region where we're all trying to make sense out of what's happening. The millennia plays, uh, play a very critical role in that, but they don't have a voice yet. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about just, you know, you growing up in Saddam's world. You know, the, the, the evil does not come with a red horn and a red face as we show it on TV. Um, but there is, as I saw Saddam as a normal person, you know, he laughed and he danced and he cooked and all of that. And I called him uncle and there is, I would lie to tell you, that there is no affection that I had towards him as uncle. Not blood uncle, just, you know, my right, father's right. friend. But I also um, knew that he was a dictator, that we were all afraid of him. Um, we were afraid of his opinion, his feelings, his everything, their, their fear. It's like, I don't know how to explain fear when it's like a poison gas leaked into your own house. Um, but it also, honestly, my encounter with someone who is as evil as Saddam, while also seeing him as a normal person, I think helped me in my life as I dealt with you know, members of the Taliban or militias in Congo or militias in whatever country I worked with. As the breakout sessions winded down, I headed out of the hermetically sealed resort and into the heart of Marrakesh's ancient city center to meet up with Hind Bensari, a Moroccan activist and documentary filmmaker who I'd heard a lot about at CGI. Hind is part of a new generation of young people throughout the Arab world who are challenging rigid governments and going around state media to redefine their countries in the wake of the Arab Spring. Hind was thrust into Morocco's national spotlight after she left her job at a London finance firm, launched Morocco's first crowdfunding campaign, and, with no experience in television, returned home to make a documentary about a shocking Moroccan law that was being used to force young rape victims into marriages with their rapists. So yeah, I saw a news article and then a second one, and then I started listening to interviews, and I just found myself reading a lot more about this particular story than doing my work. And it just felt like, you know, it was it was calling me to sort of do something. And I, I felt I had the duty to do something about it. Like having seen the Arab Spring and how things were happening, it just felt it really gave us it really gave us a feeling that, you know, we could change, you know, the, the destinies of our countries. And if we didn't, you know, we'd have to live with those consequences. So you do this project. And then you just what you throw it up on YouTube, right? Um, and then yeah, one day we just posted everything on online in three languages, uh, free to download, free to um, to play as many times as possible. And um, and to our big surprise, having spent literally zero dollars in marketing, we had about like twenty thousand views in like five days. Thousands and thousands were sort of downloading and watching it on YouTube's on on, on Vimeo's. The press was talking about it to the point that national TV you know, had to air it and we had the record audience of the season. And from then on it was a snowball effect, you know, the media attention didn't stop, you know, people's reaction didn't stop. Um, I, I sort of made it a point that it wasn't about me and I wanted people to kind of take ownership of that work uh, and help spread the work. So when people were like, can, can I show it in my school, can I show it in my university, I was like, yes, please do it, you know. Right. If I can't come, it doesn't matter, you know. Right, own the message and just it's it's your work as, as much as mine and that's why it's free uh, it's free to see and to share um, and that and that ultimately led to a parliamentary debate that um, ultimately led to repealing that law after my meeting with Hind it was time to take inventory of the entire Clinton Global Initiative experience I had traveled to Morocco with a simple question is there anything concerning the Clinton Foundation that all of us, as young voters in the United States and as young global citizens, should be worried about? And unfortunately, I think the answer is yes. But the smoking gun was not at the event. It was not a lavish hotel, tight press restrictions, or hush-hush after-hours cocktail parties, as many in the media have suggested. 
In fact, the event itself was pretty inspiring. There was a palpable excitement in the air, a powerful melding of ideas, and many commitments to action that will improve hundreds of thousands of lives when they are completed in the coming years. The people I connected with were extraordinary as well. People like Savan thinking up new ways to alleviate poverty. People like Zainab leading the discussion on so many Middle East issues. And people like Hind redefining their countries in the wake of the Arab Spring. But the real problem with the Clinton Foundation had much more to do with why the event was held in Morocco rather than what happened once everybody actually got there. And to understand this, you have to dive into the messy controversy surrounding Morocco's occupation of a little-known chunk of desert called Western Sahara. For decades, Morocco has fought to gain control over Western Sahara's wealth of naturally occurring phosphates. The immense sacrifice Morocco endured to win these battles has made retaining control over this territory a crucial test of the Moroccan king's strength and legitimacy amongst his people. A test that the king cannot afford to take lightly in the wake of the Arab Spring. Now this is where the Clintons come back into the mix, because Morocco's claim over Western Sahara is disputed at the United Nations. As a result, the king needs strong U.S. diplomatic support in order to ensure that this dispute is resolved in Morocco's favor. This need has made Hillary Clinton a major target for Morocco's well-developed lobbying network in Washington, D.C. First, as a Secretary of State at the helm of U.S. foreign policy, and more recently as a promising 2016 presidential candidate. Hillary's relationship with the Kingdom of Morocco seemed to follow her to the Clinton Foundation as well. Just a few weeks before the event in Marrakesh, it was revealed that the foundation had only planned the event in exchange for a $1 million donation from a Moroccan company called OCP. OCP is owned by the Moroccan government, it's the world's leading exporter of phosphates, and it mines more of those phosphates from the disputed Western Sahara territory than any other company. And this is where the problem lies, because it suddenly appears that the reason this event was held in Morocco was not primarily to help people to find solutions to the world's most pressing challenges to convene global leaders as the Clinton Foundation had publicized. Instead, it appears that this event was actually held in Morocco so that the Clinton Foundation could accept a gift from the country's leadership, a gift that is very much a part of a broader diplomatic and lobbying effort to influence U.S. policymakers on the Western Sahara issue. And as we enter the 2016 election cycle, this revelation calls a lot about Hillary's carefully crafted candidacy into question. Was she really a transformational Secretary of State who helped build the inspiring foundation that I saw in Marrakesh? An organization dedicated to fostering a global network of forward-looking millennial-style activism? Or, once you get behind the scenes, is Hillary just another politician who concealed her unflattering political maneuvering behind the lofty promises of a DC-style charity?